with Christian and our showcase on data. Let's welcome him to the stage. Hi, everybody. All right. Um, I'm Christian Granada. I'm super excited to be here. This is, I think, year three to be talking to y'all. Um, it's early, so I'm going to start with a joke. I've got a three-year-old at home, um, and you're all New Yorkers, right? So have you all heard the under construction joke? It's not done yet. Oh, terrible. Uh, Three-year-old dad jokes is like my business now. Um, but the point is, under construction is why we're all here, right? Everything that we're doing is under construction. The businesses that we're building, the technology that we're developing, the students that we're growing, the economic ecosystem here in the city is still under construction. It's never going to stop. And so we want to keep building together. And at Verizon, that means a couple things that I want to talk to you guys about today. So one, I want to talk about the past successes that we've seen with the NYC Media Lab and the partnership we've had with the team, which has been fantastic. Two, I want to make some announcements about some new things that Verizon as a company has been doing here in New York, um, physically and through programs. Three, I want to tell you why that matters, right? Why do you all care about the phone company? It's kind of not the phone company anymore, and we want to sort of work with you to change that mindset. And then lastly, I want to go and bring up some rock star examples of people that are working in some of these spaces. So how do you take data and turn it into something meaningful for businesses, communities, users, customers, et cetera? So um, I want to talk about past successes. So uh, a couple of things that you heard this morning from, from James and, and Kai um, was about, uh, I'll steal this from James. He said, uh, it's about connecting great ideas. And as a phone company, we like the sort of connection thing, but it's the ideas that get connected between academics, uh, businesses, startups, that really get us excited. And so if you go back a couple years, we started the Connected Futures program where we gave grants out to students um, and professors. Um, one of the examples that Kai gave was VidRover. Um, we knew VidRover while well, VidRover wasn't VidRover yet. They were a team at Columbia working on some technology, gave them a grant, and have seen them succeed all throughout the last couple of years from a team on campus to someone in the combine to someone who went through Techstars to someone who's now part of Verizon's Media Tech Venture Studio um, and is working with us as a commercial company to develop some new technology together. And so really, if you look at that arc, for us as a company, it's the most exciting thing where we can see talent, we can see ideas, and then make them come to life through the company. So that's thing number one. Uh, thing number two for past successes is the talent piece itself. So over the last three years, we've given numerous grants to schools across the entire city. That's why we love the NYC Media Lab, because it doesn't just re represent one school. It represents all of the schools here in, in New York. And so um, hiring folks from CUNY to Cornell Tech to Columbia and everything in between, we've had pretty good success bringing in, and you saw some of those wonderful faces on the screen when Amy was talking, um, to bring them in to product management roles, data science roles, and what we call the Concept Studio, which is a six-month entrepreneurship program where they go and develop new concepts and learn about the businesses that Verizon's growing into. So successes on the commercial front, successes on the talent front, and honestly, successes for the internal Verizon culture because we spent thousands and thousands of hours with you uh, giving feedback, getting feedback, getting new ideas, and it's really that time that's the face time, the collaborative time, that's the most important for us because authentic relationships and what you speak about when you're next to the coffee machine um, or walking down the street are really what's going to drive the community here forward. So thank you all for being a part of our past successes. And you know, we as an organization want to double down on it. And so uh, I'm happy to announce a couple things today. So the first thing is in the last uh, couple months, we've been working on a partnership uh, with Allie. Uh, which is a co-working community here in New York to develop Verizon-powered um, alley spaces. And so on 24th Street, uh, 119 West 24th, is a new uh, facility called Alley Powered by Verizon. And we've part with, partnered with Alley across three different cities to start bringing what I just talked about, the relationships, the partnership, to life through physical space. And so uh, we've opened spaces in New York on 24th Street, one in Cambridge and one in Washington, D.C. 
we're really making all of this open innovation stuff come to life. Uh, and so on 24th Street, we have product teams, we have our VRAR lab, we've got folks from our IoT group all coming together to live, breathe, work with the startup community. So it's a bunch of startups, it's our media tech venture studio, it's the community around it. Um, and so starting tomorrow, we're kind of opening the doors through a workshop. And so I'm gonna talk about some of those topics here in a second. So happy to announce Ali, uh, powered by Verizon opening and making that the hub of how we connect with you guys and enable you guys. Um, play on words is like, we wanna be your Ally, Ally, at Ally. Eh, this is a stretch, I'm sorry. Um, so at the Alley, we wanna go and be your advocate. We wanna give you spaces for your startups to thrive, connections, um, not just to the network, but to the people that can help empower you um, and places to have good conversations to build relationships. Uh, and so the second part of this is I'd like to announce Connected Futures 3. Uh, I think we're not getting super creative with the sequels here and naming, but Connected Futures 3 is another grant program that we're happy to go and announce across all the schools in New York City, um, specifically focused on augmented reality. And so when you go and look at things like how people interact socially through augmented reality, how people um, understand the tracking of particular points in augmented reality, trying to figure out what the right human-computer interaction is in augmented reality. These are some of the broad topics that we'd love to go and continue to work with you, support you, um, and hopefully sit side by side with you as we collaborate to bring those ideas to life. So Connected Futures 3, uh, there's an awesome, also created URL nycmedialab.com.org slash Verizon. Um, you'll see applications opening up there right now. So um, we're putting real emphasis in building our relationships with you even more deeply uh, at the space through this program. Uh, we're happy to announce that we're gonna work with the NYC Media Lab on a conference uh, in the next couple of quarters where we're gonna talk about the future of sports, sports technology, sports media, and the intersection of all of that in a world of uh, new types of content, content consumption, content uh, interactivity. So, Connected Futures 3, uh, sports conference around technology, and a couple other things we've got coming down the pipe that you'll hear more about over time. So, what else? Why do you care about Verizon? Besides your phone bill, right? Like, I get that, right? You gotta look at it every month. Um, Verizon and the infrastructure that we go and build help a number of the experiences that you're talking about. So how many of you have experienced lag time when you put the VR goggles on? How many of you have experienced um, problems with latency when it comes to the connection that you've got? How many of you have built that IoT device or that robot that just isn't moving fast enough when you're trying to pick up the object? Um, raise your hands, right? Like how many of those projects, like, man, you just wish it was faster. So what we want to do is work with you to not just understand the constraints of today. We were having a, a discussion the other day uh, with Ken Prone over at NYU about making that trade-off and how the experience in multi-person VR environments uh, is between what kind of, do you need 1080p? What kind of 4K can be in there? How do you make those decisions about the product and the experiences that you're building? Because you've gotta know, man, there's constraints on what I can connect to today. And so we wanna sort of open that up from a network and a connectivity perspective. And so when you look at what Verizon's doing, we are the sort of broadest and um, most live around 5G technology. So we've got 11 live markets today. Um, when you look at the amount of data, because this is a conversation about data too, if you look across all of our different touch points, we've got two trillion bytes per second being brought into our uh, ecosystem. When you think about non-obvious areas of, of what the company represents, we actually have the world's largest telematics company. So connected cars, connected fleets, um, the management of all those uh, logistics and supply chain issues. I think we've got 41 million billion, 41, 41 million miles driven uh, every day. And so these are the new ecosystems that we're looking to go and dive into. Um, and these are the experiences that we wanna sort of unbound based off of the constraints of what you see today when you try and make those decisions about the technology that you go and use. 
And so we're super excited about these areas. It's the topics that we're all talking about. But for us, it's about opening up the mindset. What can you do? How do you continue to go and build? Because we're still all under construction. And so uh, want to continue to talk about some of those rock stars that we have who are doing that today, some of the, the folks that we're supporting here uh, through the NYC Media Lab, some of that, some of that looking at what you can do with data and how you go and explore some of these new experiences together. Um, I'll end with uh, doors are open tomorrow at the alley. That's one of the workshops that Justin had mentioned earlier. Um, and so come, we're going to talk a lot about 5G technology. We're going to talk about the future of the intelligent edge network and what that means for how you go and build your new experiences. And we're looking for partners to go and work with us to go and explore what that technology can do, uh, make available some platforms for you to go and test so that your ideas and your boundaries on what you think the capabilities of what technology can give your experiences are really open up so you can do more, think about the future. Um, if you think about a couple years ago, in the 3G world, there was no app ecosystem because you couldn't do all the things that you can do today on the phone. So we're looking to go and continue to build out from there. So uh, sign up for the workshop. We're happy to see you. I think there's um, plenty of yummy stuff, food, technology to go and test out. Um, if you have an idea about what you can do on the next generation network, give us an email. It's openinnovation at verizon.com. Uh, we're looking for partners, and we're looking for talent. Um, coming off of university campuses to hire. So with that, I want to transition to some of those awesome rock stars who are looking at data today. Uh, first, I want to introduce Travis. Uh, Travis Riddle is a postdoc at Columbia University. Um, he's been doing amazing work with Audible and Amazon around metadata um, and looking forward to hearing how data coming in off of that network can enable some new experiences for content. So Travis. Okay, thanks Christian. You guys can hear me in the back? Okay, uh, so today I'm gonna talk to you about testing information extraction systems, and this is a collaboration between uh, folks at Columbia University and Audible. Uh, so in particular, on the Audible side, we have uh, Rush and Dan. Rush is the head of content engineering, and Dan is the director of data science. And then at the Columbia side, Ansaf's a lecturer in the computer science department. Jaywan's a bright undergraduate. He's a math and computer science major. Um, and I'm a postdoc in the psychology department. I've since moved to uh, Princeton. So just to familiarize you a little bit with Audible, I'm sure most of you are familiar with what this company does, but it's an audiobook company. Uh, they were founded in 1995, and they have over 180,000 different titles. These include, obviously, audiobooks, but it also has podcasts and a variety of other audio content. And when we started this project, uh, the first thing that we asked was, what is the motivation here? Why is Audible interested in doing this project, and how can we best help them? And in particular, after a few conversations, we kind of settled on this idea that really the the kind of primary motivation here is how can we improve the customer's customer experience and in particular with a focus on search discovery and recommendation of new content and given our backgrounds uh, in kind of natural language processing and data science uh, we sought to do this using the raw text of audiobooks so when you're listening to an audiobook obviously you don't see the text but underlying that audio experience there is some raw text available and you know there's a, a reasonably well developed set of systems that are designed for pulling out information from text these are called information extraction systems and these systems tend to be used to identify things like people places and organizations in text so this is the introductory line from the bell jar it's a, a novel by sylvia plath if you listen to this on uh, audible's platform you would be listening to it narrated by maggie gillenhall um, and the first line reads, it was a queer, sultry summer, the summer they electrocuted the Rosenbergs, and I didn't know what I was doing in New York. So if you run something like this through the typical information extraction system, you would be able to identify things like Rosenbergs are a group of people, New York is a place. Um, and so this would be useful from, for a kind of content recommendation perspective, because if you know that a user is listening to books that feature New York prominently as a place, then you might uh, be able to infer that this user probably likes to read books about New York. And so then we may be able to recommend, that, recommend them other books about New York. And this is, uh, you know, this set of procedures is called information extraction systems. 
Now, I think somewhere in, uh, in the program it said that this was a prototyping session. And so, in principle, that would mean that the next step here is to prototype some new pipeline, right? Where we ingest some data, fit a new model, and then serve up some new or better recommendations. But in a two-month time frame that we had, this was not really going to be a practical approach. And so this is kind of off the table. In a different kind of ideal world, we might develop a brand new model where we, or a new algorithm. But again, two-month timeline, this is not really a practical approach. So instead, uh, what we sought to do was uh, figure out from Audible's perspective, what kind of information could we demonstrate to them that would be valuable for the organization, right? If we're not going to build brand new systems or models, you know, maybe we can just give them some information that would be useful for them in terms of making business decisions. Um, and so what we eventually settled on was com Audible actually has an internal information extraction system. Um, and so we settled on comparing their information extraction system with some open source alternatives. And these open source alternatives are widely used. Some of them are pretty cutting edge to come from the last year or so of academic publications. And so really, we wanted to answer two specific questions. First, is Audible's system comparable to some of these cutting edge open source alternatives? And then second, in a head-to-head -head comparison, uh, which system do users prefer, right? Do they prefer the output that's provided by Audible's system, or do they prefer the output provided by one of these open source alternatives? And so what we found was that Audible's system compares pretty favorably with these alternatives. And additionally, in a head-to-head -head comparison, we asked some crowdsource workers, which do you prefer? Do you prefer the Audible system, or do you prefer the tags provided by this open source alternative? And Audible's system uh, tended to come out on top, but interestingly enough, we also found some contexts where uh, Audible system didn't come out on top. So for certain types of tags, it seemed like the open source alternative was providing better information. So thinking about the next steps, where would we take this project moving forward? So the, I think one of the obvious things to do is to try to figure out some way of kind of integrating these two systems, right? Audible system works pretty well in general. But we found some points where they could probably improve if they integrated some of the uh, details from these open source alternatives. And additionally, one of the things that the research team thought a lot about while we were completing this project is this question of genre, right? So taking the location example, uh, if we're extracting location from audiobooks and we're connecting that to maybe some real world data, this works all fine and dandy when the locations are things like New York or other places on planet Earth. But uh, if you were to do this for Game of Thrones, it might identify Winterfell as a location. And if you try to locate Winterfell on planet Earth, it's going to be a little of a uh, difficult problem. And so, you know, this is something that we definitely have to consider as we're kind of building these systems and um, trying to integrate this, these different kinds of information. So just to conclude, uh, Audible's system, we were able to show them that it works pretty well in comparison with what we know to be possible at the moment. Additionally, we were able to show that it's possible to obtain some performance improvements by integrating some insights from some of these more cutting edge alternatives. And then kind of stepping back at a, and in, um, looking at this from a broader perspective, uh, these short projects, we're not going to build brand new pipelines or you know, develop new, new models. So instead, uh, I think the idea is to orient these projects along the lines of informative exploration. So find some information that can be useful to the organization um, and can highlight ways for them to move forward. So this particular project, before, uh, before this project was begun, Audible had an information extraction system, but it wasn't totally clear how it stacked up against what, is poten what, uh, what we could potentially do. Once the project was completed, we were able to show that Audible's system is indeed effective, and we actually have some ideas about how to make it more effective. Projects like that, and all the projects you're going to see today, um, they only took maybe eight to 12 weeks to happen. So just keep that in mind in terms of the speed of what these teams were able to do in a short amount of time. Team number two from NYU. Here we're talking about some awesome technology around accessibility, um, interfaces and personalizations. You've got a team of designers, engineers, uh, human computer interaction experts to talk about their project. So go ahead. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Claire. Uh, this is Paul to my left, Serena, Olivia, and Gabriella. 
And before we talk to you guys about the work we did with the NYC Media Lab uh, this summer, I'd like to introduce you to the NYU Ability Project. Um, and the NYU Ability Project is a very unique collaboration between uh, Steinhardt Occupational Therapy, Tisch Interactive Telecommunications Program, as well as Tandon Engineering's uh, Integrated Digital Media Programs. And um, we sort of work in the space of assistive and rehab technologies. We also work on accessibility solutions, um, disability studies. We teach a number of undergraduate and graduate level classes. Uh, we have community programming, child and youth programming, and do a number of workshops. Um, we take a very human-centered approach to the design and research work that we do um, and try to consider people with a range of different disabilities, incorporating their perspectives and feedback uh, throughout our entire process. So the work that we did this summer centers around uh, digital accessibility and carries forward the principle that technology serves people best when they participate in its design. Uh, we were commissioned by Charter Communications to explore the accessibility of their home entertainment products and services. And with them, uh, actually I'll tell you a little bit about the team. Uh, some of them are present today, but we like much of the Ability Project, the composition um, of the Ability Project, we were comprised of a team of students uh, from IDM, Integrated Digital Media, ITP, Interactive Telecommunications, as well as Steinhardt Occupational Therapy. And we couldn't do any of the work that we did without our uh, community partners at ADAPT Community Network, the Braille and Talking Book Library uh, through New York Public Libraries, uh, the NYC Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, and the Helen Keller uh, Services for the Blind uh, helped us to rec recruit community members to uh, partake in our design process. Um, the, the project took three distinct phases. Uh, initially, we did a product evaluation of all of uh, Charter Communications products. Uh, and then with the feedback we got from end users, we developed prototypes, uh, which we then user tested. So modeled this iterative, user-centered process throughout. Uh, we co-created a number of goals with uh, Charter Communications. Most importantly, uh, they wanted us to humanize accessibility issues to do with home entertainment. And we also uh, considered a range of disabilities in our process, as well as uh, modeled a framework for inclusive and participatory design that uh, hopefully they can adapt in their own design process going forward. So a strength of the Ability Project is our ability to balance participatory design and the interdisciplinary research backgrounds that a lot of our members hold. Um, and our most useful data throughout this project is the opinions and reactions and feelings of the participants that we're working with, which we think is especially important when designing for accessibility. Um, so we kept our users a part of the process from evaluation all the way through the solutions. And we think that that's necessary to understanding what worked and what didn't. Um, and at least at the time of the initial product evaluation, a lot of Charter Spectrum's apps were in the didn't work category. Um, but through the evaluation that we did with our users and kind of taking note of all the roadblocks, we noticed some trends that allowed us to design some creative solutions. Um, for example, the inconsistencies of metadata made it so that users couldn't trust some of the accessibility settings that were available within the apps. Um, and the differences between the layouts of the different applications were needlessly confusing. And so seeing this opportunity for standardization allowed us to design accessibility solutions that were both traditional and immediately implementable as well as creative. Um, so we went ahead and user tested the current live version of the site for accessibility and usability. And based on our findings, we made prototypes of the graphical user interface, which are screen reader compatible and meet accessibility standards. And then we invited end users back to test our prototypes. And we updated the prototypes based on our findings of their accessibility and usability. And the product of that process is what you see there. And we also made improvements um, to make the prototypes more screen reader compatible. And these improvements are fairly standard, but are also the process of this user testing. And they include addition of proper labeling to elements, a hierarchical information architecture with semantic construction so that if there's a button, it says it's a button and it's labeled in the back end. A prominent search feature at the, top of at the top of the navigation. A clearly separated main page from the content. 
a larger text, a reduction of info clutter, and a prominent favorites page um, to ease navigation. And in order to address some of the confusion that we found during our product evaluation, we developed an onboarding prototype that acquaints the user with specific product features and most importantly, accessibility settings. And we also uh, try to uh, account for the inconsistencies in the delivery of closed captioning and descriptive services by developing a prototype that filters through crowdsource audio descriptions by using IBM's text-to-speech and tone analyzer APIs, which uh, work by picking the best description by eliminating those that contain colloquialism and bias. So we tested our digital prototypes with end users, but we also asked them to build their ideal remote control to get information about what features were important to them and where they expected to find it on the remote. With this information, we came up with three possible solutions. The first um, is a remote control app that's implementable immediately and could take advantage of the user's uh, accessibility settings that they already have set up on their phone. The second is a more traditional remote control that we might be used to seeing today. And the third is a future concept. So we found this uh, whole human-centered iterative process uh, really valuable and rich with information. And some of the key uh, insights that we gleaned from the whole process was that uh, partial accessibility is not ac acceptable and not accessible. Um, small changes uh, can make a huge difference in accessibility. Uh, good user experience is crucial. Uh, users are adept at learning new systems and just need guidance to do so. Also, accessibility should be considered at every stage of the user journey. Um, emerging technologies like AI and crowdsourcing present rich opportunities uh, for innovation and accessibility, and improvements in access benefit all users. Thanks, guys. That's it. Thank you, guys. Come back out in a couple minutes. Cool. Thank you very much. Perfect example there of how you actually have to work and sit with users along the way and how technology can help accessible um, needs come to life more and more. Um, next up, we're going to switch gears a little bit from student and academia projects to um, startups that are coming out of the NYC Media Lab ecosystem. So I'd like to introduce uh, Chris from Geopipe. Uh, Geopipe was a member of the Media Lab's Combine program um, and is also uh, looking at virtual copies of physical spaces. Uh, I'll let him sort of describe what that is. But Chris, come on out. There you are. Morning, everyone. Have you ever thought about what it would take to make a perfect copy of New York City, San Francisco, or Paris that you could explore in your own computer? Hi, I'm Christopher Mitchell, and I'm excited to introduce you to Geopipe. Geopipe automatically builds virtual models of the real world. Professionals from countless fields need virtual models for their own applications. They use these models for everything from renderings to videos to more interactive applications like video games, walkthroughs, and even VR simulations. Unfortunately, it's a hard problem to actually get these virtual models in the first place. These professionals generally have to start with some kind of data collection, whether this is going out and working with an existing data source or hiring somebody to fly a drone, drive a car, and get the data that they need. They then have to do some kind of data processing to actually turn this bulk of raw data into something that's useful to them, into a model that they can load into their own applications. For example, insurance, adjust, insurance appraisers may need to understand what's going to actually happen if a natural disaster suddenly dumps a large amount of rain on a vulnerable area. Or, as another example, you might need to figure out what the view is going to look like out the window of a building that hasn't even been built yet. There are countless other applications, from architecture to video games to virtual tourism, where these virtual models are vital. And making them as detailed, immersive, and expansive as possible is important to help users really understand the experience. Just to give you more depth about an example, consider architecture. Architects need virtual models of the world that they can put their own buildings into context in to understand how that building is going to fit into the shape of the existing neighborhood, to render those buildings for marketing 
and to show their clients' clients what they might be leasing in the end. But creating a virtual model of even a few square blocks at a low level of detail can take over an hour per square block. And as the amount of area that you need grows, that time you need grows polynomials, polynomially as well. In addition, if you need to texture those models and make them more realistic to what the world actually looks like, the time you need to make these models increases even more. And or you have to go out and get some of that expensive data collection that I talked about. Geopipe solves this by automatically generating these kinds of virtual models of the real world. We give our customers models that they can load into their own applications, meaning that not only do they save the time and money of creating these by hand, but they can work with the software and the workflow that they're already comfortable with. Therefore, the solution to actually doing that data analysis, turning this bulk of raw data into something that's useful for our customers, is Geopipe. The existing models today that people can get from free or paid sources are simple, uh, plain, and often just these low quality kinds of models you can see on the right. Geopipe not only reconstructs what the world looks like, but actually understands what's in it. From what the shape of buildings are, to where windows are, to the shape parameters of things like trees. So that our customers can customize the models that they get from us. Anywhere from just those same plain white massings, which are useful early in processes, or to emphasize a particular project that is put into those models, up to something much more photorealistic, where a user can walk through those models and feel like they're exactly in the city or the real world that they're familiar with. Here's how our users get models from Geopipe. They go into our web interface, where they can navigate to the area that interests them, draw a boundary around the piece of the model that they want to download, and then because we've figured out exactly what's in these models, select whether they want the trees, the buildings, and other components. They can then download these files immediately in industry standard formats and load them in their own software. The coolest part is how Geopipe actually works under the hood, allowing us to generate complete models of, say, New York City in under six hours. We start with raw data about the world, ranging from laser scans to street level and satellite photos to terrain contours and maps. We run this data through a set of algorithmic, uh, of, through an algorithmic pipeline that applies techniques including machine learning to understand what's in the world, building a semantic model of all of the objects and their parameters. From that rich database, we can then produce these complete 3D models that our customers can use. We're proud to announce that this week we have launched our platform, starting with virtual models of New York City and San Francisco available now. Our pricing model is based on the needs of the customers that we've spoken to in over 300 customer interviews in the last year. We offer a tiered model that scales with the needs of our customers, from $100 to $500 per user per month for an increasing number of models, scale of models, and quality of the models that users get from us. For non-commercial applications, including students who want to use models and customers who are curious to test out our models before they pay for a subscription, we also have a free tier. We're playing within the $4.5 billion space of 3D mapping and 3D modeling, set to grow to $16 billion by 2020. Within that, about $500 million was spent last year specifically on creating virtual models of the real world for things like special effects, video games, architecture, and beyond. We believe that there are countless applications that are going to be unlocked as it becomes increasingly important to explore the world in virtual space, including many applications we can't even envision yet in virtual reality and augmented reality. As a very first stepping stone, a market that we can meet with our technology as it is right now, we're looking at the $100 million space of architecture. I'm Dr. Christopher Mitchell. I love trains, and my co-founder Thomas is rarely seen without a Star Wars t-shirt. But much more relevantly, my co-founder and I share a deep abiding passion for distributed systems and for algorithms. I graduated with my PhD in distributed systems uh, from NYU Computer Science about two years ago. And my co-founder Thomas is a PhD candidate at Brown, also in computer science, focusing on applying the algorithmic lens to interdisciplinary simulation and modeling problems. We both got started with this problem for, from a passion for applications in the video game space. And we both have the complementary skills we need to take huge amounts of geographic data, store and process it, and intelligently understand exactly what's in that data. Geopipe itself was founded about 15 months ago during NYU's summer launchpad program, where we first learned about the lean launchpad methodology and started our customer discovery process. 
we continued with the NYC Media Labs Combine program, which is how we met Justin, Amy, Alexis, and the other great people who have helped us a lot through their ongoing work, including the Exploring Future Realities event that we went to last year and the demo day at the summit exactly one year ago. Through those programs, we conducted over 300 customer discovery interviews, as I mentioned, talking to professionals like architects, video game designers, special effects creators, um, real estate developers, and many others who helped us understand the problems that they were facing, the customer ecosystem that we would be working within, and the economics of how they actually buy and pay for services like ours. We have gotten over 385K in non-dilutive funding so far from programs like the Summer Launchpad, NYC Media Lab, um, from the NSF and from NYU's 300K competition. And this summer we were in the Techstars NYC Summer 2017 cohort, which is finishing up this week. We're passionate about putting the real world into virtual space and making it possible for anyone to explore, modify, and even render the real world. We're raising our seed round right now, and we're also looking for customers who are very interested in getting virtual models like these to explore and use in their own applications. If you are as passionate about us as the real world and the space of turning raw data into something useful, immersive, and rich, we would love to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Um, another great example of the community here within the academic ecosystem working through and with the NYC Media Lab all the way through the accelerator programs like Techstars here in the city to create a platform that not only takes data at mass and turns it into something tangible, but allows other developers and creators to turn those into new experiences. So definitely love that one. Um, last but not least, want to introduce you all to Evan and Remo Haptics. Uh, this was one of the, the participants in the Verizon Connected Futures 2 program over the past year and is exploring how athletes and sensors and uh, He'll tell you a little bit more about the magic behind it. Um, but really want to introduce Remo Haptics. Evan, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here from Remo Haptics, and we are a sports training company. So I'm going to start with a little bit of exercise. So if you're able, I'd like to ask you to, to stand up in your seats. And I'm going to lead you in a little bit of a routine. Um, now, these, these instructions are going to come quickly, so just listen closely. OK. So if everyone could reach their right hand up towards the ceiling with their hands spread wide, now turn your thumb to the left and begin tapping the toes of your left foot. Spreading the fingers of your left hand, reach your left hand over your head, touch your right pinky to your left elbow, and your right wrist to your forehead. <laughs> wow. OK, I see, I see a lot of confusion out in the room. And, and no one really looks like they understand what's going on. Um, please take, take your seats. Um, but I do this to illustrate how difficult it can be to translate rapid verbal commands into movements. And if you're a high-level athlete, taking these types of instructions from your coach in real time and translating them into movement can be very difficult. Um, and getting these minute changes in your movement patterns right can be the difference between first place and not placing at all. What, but what if you could hack this learning process? What if you could download the body awareness of a professional athlete? At Remo Haptic Training, we can. Um, I'm here today with my co-founders. Sorry, I'm, I'm a CEO and co-founder here at, at Remo Haptics, Evan Huggins. And I'm here with my co-founders, Aaron Nesser and Rebecca Pales Friedman. We're a team that was uh, founded out of a collaborative class between Pratt Institute and NYU. And we are a group of, of sportswear, hardware, and user experience designers with experience working with athletes from beginners to professionals. We've developed a wearable coaching system that monitors an athlete's movements, recording their motion, and then suggests using vibration-based cues how to move more efficiently. So rather than interpreting verbal cues, you instantly feel a vibration on your skin 
and adjust your movement pattern. Sorry. Um, so when your elbow pokes out during your tennis serve or your jump shot falls short, you feel what went wrong. Now, we had, um, we had this great technology, but we needed to figure out who our first 100 customers were. And luckily we participated in NYC Media Lab's Combine program, where we invested hundreds of hours going out into the city, speaking with athletes, and figuring out who would be the first people to adopt this technology. We found that cyclists are an incredible group of athletes, that they obsess over data. Um, and that they're constantly looking at their cadence, at their heart rate, and at the power of their pedal stroke. And that they'll adopt new technologies to address these problems. Not only this, but the cyclists we spoke with all spent between two and $10,000 a year on training goods alone. And then we zoomed out and looked at the global market and found that cycling is actually the biggest segment of the global sporting goods market with $45.6 billion in annual revenue. Um, and that more than half of this market goes to training and accessories. Um, so we have a product, I mean, sorry, we have a, we have a market and we had a concept. And with that in mind, we developed the Remo Smart Knee Suit. It's a two-part system. The silicone housing clicks in just below the knee and includes motion capture and movement analysis technology. Underneath, there's a, fa a thin fabric knee sleeve that has a, an array of vibration motors incorporated into the knit. As the athlete pedals, the system picks up their three key metrics about their, um, their movement. Stroke symmetry, alignment of the knee, and cadence. These metrics are, are analyzed using a proprietary algorithm and then the correct haptic signals to move them back into alignment or, or round out their stroke are sent to the knee sleeve. Simultaneously, the device aggregates a metric which essentially quantifies form into one easy number. Um, this metric is sent to the smartphone and athletes can use it um, both to, comp to track their, their workout in real time and to compete against their friends in spin class, in a training, or in a competitive um, scenario. Commercial opportunities for this technology extend well beyond cycling into almost every sports category. Um, and when it comes to team activities, coaches can utilize our technology to um, communicate with all of their players in a new way and track their, their collective um, patterns as a team. In the world of professional sports, we flip the numbers around, packaging our, our metrics and selling them for broadcast. And in the, the world of VR and AR, which will be a huge emerging area in the sports training um, field, technologies like ours that give real sensation add a critical component to the VR experience. We are working on strategic partnerships with Peloton, Sports Radar, and Verizon. And we've done alpha testing with and um, are getting support from coaches at the Sports Center at Chelsea Piers, the NYU and Columbia cycling teams, and Tailwind Endurance. We're ready to change the way you train. We hope you'll join us. Thank you.